is actually. Minute or so that we can have the last couple yeah. of questions. Yeah. Yeah, I actually saw the last two questions as very connected, yeah, um, sure and so yeah. I'm at the risk of so sounding like I'm going to contradict myself. I think <laughs> the we do want the science as vocation, but it only works on the flip side if. Um, how should we produce the knowledge? And that goes back to, to Anna's point about sort of listening to um, silenced voices or finding silenced voices and then bringing them out. Um, I think it's, it's important to think very carefully what we study um, and sort of how we listen to that, uh, that, that we study. Um, and this is why I, I, I really couldn't come up with a good um, graphic for that. But the, so I picked the SDGs, which sort of always works. Um, but, you know, if I look at um, what people in my world, sort of a business school world and management world study, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's very narrowly focused on a few of those, primarily economic value creation. <laughs> um, and we don't study many of the other things. And we, we, so I think it's, it's really important to go out and um, generate knowledge about things that um, um, are not represented well. Um, and by generating knowledge about them, uh, we bring them to the fore, we make them more visible, and we, we might enable you know, subsequent action. And so I, I, I think if we want to sort of change the world of tomorrow, um, we, we have to sort of diversify what we actually look at. So. Yeah, so I chose just the cover of, um, uh, of a book, uh, one of my very favorite ethnographies by uh, Mitch Abolafia on uh, Wall Street. Mm -hmm. and, and I chose it because it speaks to uh, the question that I faced as I turned to try and understand the financial crisis, which is that I was clearly coming at it from uh, a position of moral outrage. And as I, as I faced the question of how to do research and how to stay with my uh, moral engagement um, without letting that get me in the way of my process, my research, I stumbled upon a, a very unique situation where I was able to follow actors on Wall Street who themselves were morally outraged. And so that allowed me to um, stay connected to that uh, moral emotion while at the same time um, have the necessary empathy to, to actually accomplish the field work and the interviews and the listening. And so I guess this is just um, a call for um, morally committed and morally um, engaged research. So it's a vicarious moral outrage? I suppose uh, that's part of it. I like it. Yes. And uh, Kevin, yeah, and I know you've been talking a lot about teaching. Feel free to morph that. <laughs> Well, I might have answered more probably accurately how how will knowledge or knowing be produced um, in the future. I think as as academics, um, our information base has so drastically increased. Um, if I compare what our PhD students have to learn in terms of all the theories, all the different disciplines, all the different methods, just to be just to follow the norm, it's a much heavier cognitive load, and a load that can't we can't feasibly expect to be finished in four or five years. Um, so it gets back to the, the continuous learning. Um, and we have so many journals, um, and now people are tweeting and writing blog posts, and so there's just an overwhelming amount of information, but it not only applies to us, it applies to everyone. And in that information overload, context, um, you need mediation. You need filtering. Um, some of that filtering will be very positive uh, for us. Some of it we already see can be very negative. So right now, you know, I've, I've lived through the transition of seeing our news transform to a situation where, for example, if you had a politician on from one party you know, for five minutes, you had to give equal access to the other party for five minutes. Um, and every station had pretty much the same news, and then they gave a little editorial spot at the very end for 90 seconds to the, the head newscaster. Um, today, we have news that is mediated and filtered 
for our own particular interests and biases, not just political interests and biases, but if we don't want to watch news and we want to watch the cooking channel for 24 hours, <laughs> we can do that too. And with AI, you know, and in that in that um, movie with Tom uh, Tom Cruise, uh, where he's shown kind of walking in front of that. Uh, some big signpost that's empty, and then as soon as he walks past it, a customized advertisement pops up. That's happening. There's, I just read there's a company that's making shoes, and they're putting tags in the shoes so that when you walk by kiosks, it will pop up customized advertising. So we are going to see with AI, right now, you know, you can set your own filters, right? You have some control to some extent over what you see, what information you get. Um, in the future, that's going to become more and more mediated by other parties. Um, and that customized knowledge, um, at first, you know, it's a good endorphin hit because it's it knows what gets our attention. Um, but we're probably going to be less, even though with that wealth of information there, we're probably going to be less exposed to a variety of viewpoints and a variety of information and data that would be healthier. Great, thank you. And there's a nice juxtaposition, I think, with Wendy's, uh, you're, you're punished by going first every time, and you get to wrap this up. <laughs> okay. So I like the contrast between those two yeah. slides. Yeah. Um, well, I'd like to first say something in response to, to Anna, which is um, I think it's really important that we conduct research that shows how certain voices are eliminated and are suppressed. Um, and so that, that's part of our responsibility, that's part of our, should be part of our moral, um, our moral framework when we're, when we're academics, especially sociologists. And I also really like Ju Jung's point about um, the importance of, uh, sh she describes it in terms of a sociological imagination, but, you know, a way of uh, conveying to people that, um, that what they're experiencing isn't a personal problem, it's, it's, a, it's a problem related to big structural forces that's going to require lots of people to attack it. Um, so I think um, those are two important things um, when we're thinking about research. Uh, the reason I chose this slide was because I think the kind of work that we're going to do in the future, uh, it's got to be collaborative. And this is a slide of, you know, so, so supposedly all scientists in white coats looking at how to grow something, but, oh, sorry. Nope. Um, but um, I think what we're d desperately going to, of course, need the STEM work that shows us a, a lot of the underlying conditions related to climate change and how things work. But we're also going to need to engage with um, social scientists and policy makers and, and, uh, and artists as a way to sort of produce knowledge that can be disseminated and meaningful and have a shot at being implemented. So for me, uh, collaboration is sort of the name of what we, what we should be doing in our research. Uh, and that's, it's, you know, kind of goes along with interdisciplinarity, which we were talking about earlier, is that multiple perspectives um, are sort of going to be crucial to solve these really huge problems that we face. Mm -hmm.